Great. Well, thank you very much. Uh, happy to have uh, an audience here for uh, International Dark Sky Week. And what I'm going to do with you today is I am going to read you my story, I, Comma, Humanity, which is about how we, the human race, have discovered our place in the universe. And I'll talk about some of the science that's in the story as we go along, and we should have a little bit of time for questions at the end. Get in the right window here. So I have a little video clip. That what is our place you. in the universe? This fundamental question has been asked by almost everyone who has ever lived, but until quite recently in human history, no one really knew the answer. Today, we know that we live on a planet called Earth, which orbits one star, in one galaxy, in a universe filled with wonders far beyond anything our ancestors could have imagined. Hi, I'm author Jeffrey Bennett, and the idea for this book came to me during a recent trip to Africa, as I realized that many children around the world have not yet had the chance to learn about our modern understanding of the wonders of the universe, or of great achievements, like the moon landings, the Hubble Space Telescope, the International Space Station, and robotic exploration of Mars and other planets. To help readers feel a personal connection to all these amazing things, iHumanity uses the viewpoint of a first-person narrator who represents the entire human race living through thousands of years of history. Perhaps most exciting, iHumanity was launched to the International Space Station in December of 2015 for story time from space, in which it will be read by astronauts from orbit. For me personally, this is a dream come true because it will not only make the story accessible to children around the world, but also because I believe there's nothing quite as hopeful as being able to look up in the sky and think, we all work together to go there, so surely we can work just as well together down here. iHumanity is available in both English and Spanish, and coming soon in Japanese and hopefully other languages as well. All right, so that gives you a little introduction to uh, what gave me the motivation for writing the book. And you can see uh, that's the cover there, and the book has a dedication page that I'm showing you there, but I won't read right now. And as, it, as I explained in that little video trailer that you saw, uh, what we're going to do here, it says, imagine that you could represent the entire human race living through thousands of years of history and science. The following pages contain the story you would tell about how we've learned Earth's place in the universe. So this story is written in the first person, as though the narrator has been alive for thousands of years and doing everything that humanity's done. And I think as you already know, we live on a planet in the solar system, sorry about that, uh, in our galaxy, in the universe, and we're gonna look at how we've learned all that. So I'll read you the story and we'll talk about some of the things that are described in more detail on the pages down here and you can see it begins again you're imagining that you represent the whole human race so you were a small child thousands of years ago thousands of years ago when i was a small child i began to try to make sense of the world around me one of my earliest memories was seeing the star-filled sky at night resting like a dome upon what appeared to be a flat earth naturally i thought this vision represented reality and wondered what earth itself might rest upon and what might what might lie beyond the stars. So if you think back to thousands of years ago, when people lived in small villages, we didn't have communication to faraway places, you couldn't travel very far, it might have seemed very natural to think that the earth was just flat, that the sky was a dome above us. And you might have even, as this famous painting shows, imagined what if you could walk to the edge and poke your head out, what might you see? As centuries passed, I began to recognize patterns of motion in the sky. I learned to tell time by the sun and to keep track of the seasons by observing changes in the sun's precise daily path. I observed how the moon changes in a shape in a cycle of phases that repeats every 29 to 30 days. Near the sea, I saw the tides changing with these phases. At night, I learned to navigate by the stars and saw how the constellations change along with the seasons. And so over the many centuries, even though people lived in a relatively small villages and didn't travel very far, they began to study what they saw in the sky carefully and started to notice all these patterns. And I'll just point out one here. You notice that the phases of the moon, excuse me, my thing keeps jumping on me, the phases of the moon um, 
from new to full and back again takes about 30 days, which you might know is what we call a month. Although some people prefer to drop one of the O's and call it a month, but that is in fact how it got its name. A month is really a month. I began using my navigation skills to travel. To my surprise, I discovered new constellations as I journeyed north or south. Clearly there was more to earth and sky than I saw from home. With this knowledge, I soon understood what I saw during lunar eclipses when Earth's shadow falls on the moon. The shadow's general curvature could only mean that our world is round. In place of my old idea of a flat earth with a dome sky, I began to imagine the sky as a great sphere containing the sun, moon, and stars with our round earth located at its center. So again, if you think back to thousands of years ago, at first people thought the sky was just a dome over us and that earth was flat, but then they noticed that if they travel, they would see different stars. And that wouldn't be possible if there was just one dome over a flat earth. The only way it's possible is if by traveling, you're looking out at different parts of the sky so that you see different constellations and different stars in different directions. And then to seal that case, you can see here is a photo, a photo montage taken during a lunar eclipse. And you can see very clearly that Earth's shadow on the moon here is obviously round. And there's no way that could be possible other than that Earth is round. So people first figured out that Earth is round thousands of years ago. And so they started to imagine Earth being in the middle of this giant sphere that contained the stars. My new idea seemed to make a lot of sense. I could explain the daily paths of the sun, moon, and stars in my sky by picturing the great sphere spinning once each day around our Earth. To account for the changing seasons and the phases of the moon, I imagine the sun and moon moving slowly among the constellations on the giant sphere. So you know, we see everything rise in the east and set in the west every day. And the way they imagined this happening was they thought this sphere with the sun, moon, and stars was turning around us each day. Of course, we know now that that's backwards. It's not the sky moving around us, but it's us rotating that makes the sky look like things are moving across it from our point of view. Still, there was one thing that puzzled me. My eyes could see five bright stars that, like the sun and moon, did not stay fixed in the constellations. But instead of moving steadily in one direction like the sun and moon, these five objects sometimes turned around and went backward for a few weeks or months. I called them planets, and for a while, I wondered if they had minds of their own. And so to understand what's going on here, I want you to think about what we see in the sky. So if you watch the sky, every day the sun rises in the east and sets in the west, the moon rises in the east and sets in the west, the stars rise in the east and set in the west, but if you watch night after night, you'll see the moon gradually changes places compared to the stars. And the sun does the same. That's why we see different constellations at different times of year. And that was fairly easy for ancient people to explain because the moon and the sun move through the constellations at different rates, but always in the same direction. So they just assumed there's this sphere of the stars around us and the sun and moon gradually move around the sphere. But there were five other objects, the ones that we still call planets, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. And they moved in strange ways. And this picture shows you the idea. This is Mars taken each night a few, night, a few days apart. And you'll notice over many weeks, for a while, Mars just goes steadily in one direction. But then suddenly it turns around and for actually a couple months here, goes backwards and then turns around and goes forward again. And all of the planets do that. And that was a very strange thing to ancient people. How could it be that objects could turn around on that giant celestial sphere and sometimes go backwards? And so that was a mystery. These five objects were an especial mystery but it wasn't just these five, because they used the word planet for anything that moved through the sky compared to the stars. So there were these five planets that moved, but remember, we already said the sun and the moon also moved. 
So that made a total of seven planets, including the sun and the moon. So what were the seven planets? The sun, the moon, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. And you might be thinking, what about Earth? Well, of course, a planet, they defined it as something that moved through our sky relative to the stars. We live on the Earth, so we don't see it move. So Earth was not considered a planet back in ancient times. And I think one of the coolest things about these seven planets is that you might have wondered why we have seven days in a week. And this is the answer, because each of these seven planets gets a day, right? Sunday, moon day, Tuesday, wait. If you know Spanish, maybe uh, raise your hand if you know Spanish out there. Um, what's Tuesday in Spanish? It's Martes, so you can figure out, aha, Tuesday is Mars Day. Wednesday, Miracles is Mercury Day. Thursday, Webes is Jupiter Day. And incidentally, you can tell Thursday another way if you watch Marvel movies, because you know in the Marvel movies, Thor is the name that the Norse people had for Jupiter. And Thursday, Thor's Day is pretty obvious. Friday, Viernes in Spanish is Venus Day. And Saturn Day is pretty obvious. So the reason we have seven days in the week is because they gave a day to each of those seven planets of ancient times. I spent centuries trying to understand the mysterious patterns of the planets. Finally, about 2,000 years ago, I hit upon an idea that seemed to work, at least for a while. I imagined each planet orbiting around Earth on a small circle that turned upon a larger one so that the planet would go backward on the inner part of its circle. I used mathematics to make my picture of circles upon circles more precise so that I could use it to predict when and where the planets would appear in the night sky. So what they started to imagine was kind of shown here. They still thought Earth was in the middle of everything. They thought the planets went around the Earth, but instead of just going around the Earth, they thought the planet went around this little circle at the same time that this little circle went around the bigger circle. And if you trace what it would look like to be going around this while this is going around that, you see it traces out a pattern like that so that there is, excuse me, a short little period here where the planet goes backward. For more than a thousand years, I thought I had it all figured out. Earth was the center of the universe. The stars lay on a great sphere surrounding us and the planets moved along their circles upon circles. But as time passed and I built better tools for measurement, my predictions about planet locations in the night sky no longer seemed to work well. I began to question everything I thought I knew. Could all my ideas about the universe be wrong? And so what you see on this page is, for example, here's the moon and there's Jupiter. And maybe using the mathematics that they had for that circle upon circle model, they would make a prediction. Here's where Jupiter should be in the night sky and here's where the moon should be in the night sky. And maybe the prediction would say, excuse me, that Jupiter would be on this side of the moon, but then they'd go out and look and it was on the other side. And they started to realize, hey, these predictions are not working quite so well. And the fact that they were building better and better measuring tools made it even more obvious that these predictions were not working. So even though for more than a thousand years, people had thought they had it figured out with this model in which all everything was going around Earth with those circles upon circles, by the time we get into the 1400s and 1500s, people were starting to wonder, maybe something's wrong with this whole idea because it's not successfully predicting where planets should be in the sky. One day, I tried a new idea. Instead of imagining everything going around Earth, I envisioned Earth and the other planets orbiting the sun. I had long realized that this idea could explain the puzzling motion of the planets because a planet would seem to move backward whenever we passed it by in our orbit. I hadn't taken this idea very seriously in the past, but now I worked hard to test whether it might really be true. So remember, the key thing that's causing a mystery for people and trying to understand the universe is this strange backwards motion of the planets. And so they had that circle upon circle idea. But it turns out, also back thousands of years ago, people had realized there was another possible way to explain it. They just hadn't taken the idea seriously. 
And what's that other way? Well, if the sun is in the middle and Earth orbits the sun and the other planets orbit the sun too, then because Earth goes faster than say Mars here, if you trace the lines at different points in our orbit, it's gonna look like Mars is gonna turn around and go backwards for a while as we pass it. And so that's a very simple explanation for why we would see those planets do that strange backward motion. Why didn't people take it seriously for such a long time? Because we don't feel like we live on a moving planet, so it didn't seem natural to them. But when they started to realize that their model wasn't working so well at predicting locations in the sky, they said, well, hey, maybe that's what we should do. In fact, it was a person named Copernicus who came up with this idea again, people had thought of it in the past, and started to take it seriously to see maybe it's us orbiting the sun, not the sun and everything else orbiting us. I soon discovered laws with which I could predict the locations of planets so precisely that I was almost sure my new idea was correct. I became even more convinced after I built my first telescopes. I saw moons orbiting Jupiter, proving that Earth was not the center of everything. I saw Venus appearing to change shape in a way that proved it orbited the sun and not Earth. And I saw that the Milky Way stretching across my sky is made up of countless stars, which was proof that there is much more to the universe than meets the eye. By about 400 years ago, there was no more doubt in my mind. Earth is not the center of the universe, but just one of the planets orbiting the sun. So this all happened about 400 years ago. Kepler came up with these laws explaining how the planets moved, and once he did, now when he predicted where the planets would be in the night sky, the predictions always matched perfectly. No more of those errors like they were getting with the old idea. And then Galileo, shown here, built his telescope and saw things like moons orbiting around Jupiter. Well, if Earth was the center of everything, that made no sense because he saw these things were not going around the Earth, they were going around Jupiter. And then when he looked through his telescope at Venus, which just to our eyes looks like a bright dot in the night sky or the morning or evening sky, with his telescope, he saw Venus actually has phases, kind of like the phases of the moon, except for the only way to make sense of what he was seeing was if Venus and Earth were both orbiting the sun. And looking out at the Milky Way, which people previously had thought was basically just kind of like a painted milky band of light on the celestial sphere, he saw, no, it's actually lots of stars. And that told him that the idea that everything was on one sphere was not correct. Instead, the universe keeps going and stars are at many, many differences, distances away from us. Now that I knew the planets orbited the sun, I began to wonder why. To find out, I used the same approach that had worked so well for me already. I made careful observations. I looked for simple ways of making sense of these observations, and I used mathematics to make predictions that I could test with more observations. I called this approach science, and it soon provided my answer. The very same gravity that keeps my feet on the ground also holds the moon in orbit around the Earth and the planets in orbit around the sun. I have discovered that I live in a universe in which the same laws hold on both Earth and in space. And so here, we're now in the later part of the 1600s when Isaac Newton discovers the law of gravity, which he wrote about in this book right here. And in order to prove that, he had to invent a new kind of mathematics called calculus that he used to show that gravity is what keeps the planets orbiting the sun. And one of the most interesting things about this is you notice I've highlighted the word universe here with italics on beauty. Think about the word universe and what it means. The word universe is two parts, uni and verse. And uni means one, and verse means basically story. So universe means one story. How did he discover the universe? Because before that, people thought that Earth and what they called the heavens, all the stars and everything above us, were different. There were different realms, different laws. But Newton proved that it's the same laws, the same gravity that works down here on Earth 
and up in space. And therefore, instead of two realms, earth and the heavens, he realized there's only one, one story, one set of laws for everything. And that was the first time that humans knew that we live in a universe. My new way of doing science also helped me create new technologies. Soon I was building more and larger telescopes and each new telescope led me to new discoveries. I saw the ice caps of Mars and the rings of Saturn. I discovered two new planets, those would be Uranus and Neptune, that I'd never noticed with my eyes alone. I also found many smaller objects orbiting the sun along with the planets. At last, I realized that our Earth is just one member of a vast family of worlds held together by the sun's gravity. I call this family our solar system. Most astonishingly, I came to realize that the stars are not mere, not mere lights in the night sky. The stars are distant suns, and each would appear as big and bright to a planet orbiting one of them as our sun does to us. I wondered if any of the stars really did have planets of their own, and if so, whether those planets might have beings who see our sun as a star in their night sky. So we're now still over 300 years ago when people for the first time realized that stars are not dots on a giant sphere. Instead, they're actually other suns that are very, very far away from us, which explains why they look like little light dots in the night sky. And that made people immediately begin to wonder, could it be that some of those stars have their own planets and that maybe people on those planets see our sun as a star in their night sky. But this is still 300 plus years ago and they didn't know whether or not that might really be true. I was rapidly learning that the universe is far larger than I ever dreamed in my youth. As I studied the arrangement of stars in the sky, I discovered that our sun is part of a great collection of stars that I call the Milky Way galaxy. The galaxy has so many stars, more than 100 billion, that it would take me thousands of years just to count them out loud. We live fairly far from the center of the galaxy, and our solar system orbits around the center about once every 200 million years. The biggest change in my perspective was still to come. For a while, I was unsure if anything lay beyond the bounds of our Milky Way, but as I built even larger telescopes, I realized that the universe is full of galaxies, some so far away that their light has taken billions of years to reach us. I also discovered that the galaxies are moving farther apart with time. Apparently, our entire universe is expanding, meaning that it was smaller in the past and will grow larger in the future. So the, excuse me, the picture on this page is a famous photo from the Hubble Space Telescope. And all these objects, even the tiny ones here, are other galaxies far beyond our own. And by studying these carefully, Hubble, the person for whom the Hubble Space Telescope was named, actually discovered that galaxies are moving apart with time, which is why we say we live in an expanding universe. And this was discovered just about 100 years ago. Over the past century, my knowledge has grown at an ever faster rate. I have discovered much more about the laws of nature that govern everything from tiny atoms, excuse me, to groups of galaxies. I've used these laws to figure out how stars and planets are born and how stars live and die. My understanding of the laws of nature has also helped me recognize that the universe contains some very strange objects, including black holes, which actually bend space and time. So on this page, you see this big photo here is something called the Orion Nebula, which all the dark sky enthusiasts will know because you can see it easily through binoculars or a small telescope. And the Orion Nebula is a place where new stars are being born. This photo here is something called the Crab Nebula, and it's showing you the gas that was expelled from a star that died in an explosion we call a supernova. And this right here is a computer simulation of what it might look like to be near a black hole. And one of the really cool things about this is this simulation was made a number of years ago, but you might recall that this photo was taken last year. It's the first picture we ever got of a real black hole. If I go back 
Notice how similar the simulation looks to what the real thing looks like. And that's because we understand the physics, the math of these things so well that even before we had a real picture of one, scientists could predict pretty much what it was going to look like. And if you want to know more about this image, there's the link to an article or video that I made about it at medium.com. Go to my name uh, as Jeffrey O. Bennett, and you'll find the article and the video, and you can learn more about that. I've built larger and larger telescopes and have launched some telescopes into space where they enable me to see forms of light that cannot pass through the air to reach the ground, using computers to help analyze all the data. I've begun to understand the size and age of our entire universe. I've also confirmed that other stars really do have their own planets and that many of these planets have sizes and orbits very similar to Earth. So in terms of our history through time now, this is going back to the 1990s only, fairly recent. That's when we had the Hubble Space Telescope launched and when we first discovered for sure that there are, in fact, planets around other stars. I've even begun to travel out into space myself. I've built space stations from which I can observe observe Earth from orbit. I've walked on the moon, and while I have yet to go elsewhere myself, I've sent robotic spacecraft throughout our solar system. This painting here shows you the uh, Voyager 2 spacecraft, which visited Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, and is still moving on its way out of our solar system. These robots make me yearn for my own trips. Soon, I hope, I'll explore the mountains and valleys of Mars, walk across the ice of Jupiter's moon Europa, and sail the seas of Saturn's moon Titan. I often wonder if I'll find living creatures on these or any other worlds in our sun's family. And on this page, here you see this is an actual photo from the Curiosity rover looking out at uh, some hills and mountains on Mars. This is a painting of the surface of Jupiter's moon Europa. There's Jupiter in the sky in the background. And Jupiter's moon Europa is an ice-covered surface, but under the ice, we're very confident that it has a deep ocean of liquid water, probably more ocean water on Europa than there is on Earth. So scientists wonder if there might be life swimming in the ocean of Europa. And this is a painting on the surface of Saturn's moon Titan. You can see Saturn in the sky right there. And you'll notice that this is like a lake here on Titan. And Titan really does have lakes and seas like this, except Titan is so far from the sun that it's way too cold for liquid water to exist. All the liquid water on Titan is frozen. So these are not seas of water. They're seas of liquid methane and ethane on Titan. Despite all I've learned, I still have many questions left to answer. I know what planets and stars are made of, but I've discovered that galaxies also contain a mysterious dark matter whose nature still eludes me. Stranger still, I've discovered that the galaxies are moving apart faster today than long ago. And while I sometimes say this is caused by dark energy, I really don't know what it is or why it exists. So the picture on this page shows you some distant galaxies, but you'll notice these strange shapes in the pictures, these big arcs. And it turns out what those are is they're distorted views of galaxies, and they're distorted by the gravity of these galaxies. Uh, it's a prediction made by Einstein's general theory of relativity that was proven true with pictures like this, that gravity can change the shape of the way that we see the images of distant objects. And by measuring these carefully, scientists can figure out how much mass is in these galaxies and in these groups of galaxies. And what they've discovered is that there's a lot more matter here than what we would guess just by looking at all the stars and the galaxies. And therefore, that means there must be a lot of matter in these galaxies that doesn't give off any light. So we call it dark matter. And we know the universe is expanding. Now we might expect that gravity would slow the expansion down over time, but instead scientists found the opposite is happening. The expansion is actually speeding up over time. 
and we call that dark energy that's causing that speed up. But we don't actually know what dark energy is. We don't actually know what dark matter is. So these are two of the big mysteries in science that scientists are hoping to answer over the next few decades, which is perfect time. Maybe one of you will be the person who answers those questions for us. And of course, I wonder if I am alone or if there are others like me living on some of the billions of planets that orbit other stars. My imagination runs wild as I think of all the different types of life and civilizations that might be out there somewhere. And on this page, there's a couple of paintings. The smaller one here shows you this planet orbiting a double star here. And you'll notice in this painting, the artist has imagined that on the night side, we see lights, which must be a civilization on that planet. And in the bigger painting that you see on this page, you can see the artist is imagining a planet that's on the outskirts of our galaxy, where in their night sky, they would see our whole galaxy above them looking like that. But for now, I bring my thoughts back down to Earth to reflect on all I've learned. In a relatively short time, I have made an incredible scientific journey where once I believed myself to be the center of the universe, I now know that I am just one species living on one small planet, orbiting one ordinary star within just one of billions of galaxies in a vast universe. Most important, I've come to realize that as I've learned more about my place in the universe, I've also learned more about myself. I may be physically small, but when I put my mind to it, I am capable of great things, for I am humanity, and I am still young. If I continue to build and learn, there is no limit to what my future might hold. And that is the end of the story. Before we do questions, there is in the back of the book a glossary and a set of activities, which would be a good thing to try while you're doing some homeschooling right now. And be again, before we go to the questions, I wanted to show you a couple of other resources that you might be interested in. The first I mentioned in that video at the beginning is Storytime from Space, where astronauts read books from the International Space Station. I think some of you already saw the astronaut reading of uh, the book I just read to you, I, Humanity. I'll show you a quick clip of how this program works with a different one of my books. Hi, I'm NASA astronaut Mike Hopkins on board the International Space Station, and it's one of my favorite times. It's story time from space. Now, today's story is Max Goes to the Moon, a science adventure with Max the dog. So if you go to storytimefromspace.com, you can watch the videos of astronauts reading these books. They've read all six of my books and quite a few others by other authors, so that should be fun to check out. Um, we made a uh, movie of Max Goes to the Moon that you might be interested in. You can watch it at, at this link on my website, and I will just briefly show you the trailer for the movie so you'll know what it's like.
So again, you can stream that online. It's a 34 minute long uh, movie that you can watch. Uh, there is an app if you're interested in solar eclipses and want to see the next one in 2024. It's a free app. You can download it at totality uh, from the uh, iOS store or the Android store, totality by Big Kids Science. That's what it looks like. So you'll know you've got the right thing. And it has a bunch of uh, information about eclipses, including a couple of videos that I made here that'll help you understand eclipses. Uh, I know a lot of you are elementary school kids, but if there's any middle schoolers watching, there is at grade8science.com. Uh, you can see the middle school curriculum that I've been working on for space science, and you'll see in chapter three in particular, covers a lot of the ideas that we talked about in this book, but in more depth. Uh, global warming is a key focus of mine, and I've been on tour, obviously on hold right now, during the coronavirus times, but if people are interested in having me come speak on this topic, they can get in touch with me. And those are the six kids books that I've written. We read this one today, the others, and um, those are my books for the general public. And you can see more information about all of them at bigkidsscience.com. There's also links for ordering from Amazon or direct from the distributor. So I'm gonna stop there and we can now do questions for whatever questions you might have. So don't forget to unmute if you've got a question for me. Anybody? Amanda, that includes you. Well, thank you for the great presentation. That was a lot of fun. I um, will admit that I've been working for IDA for about three years and learned a lot from <laughs> your book. I'm not um, wholly familiar with astronomy and really loved the perspective of learning about the solar system and learning about how the universe works throughout the course of humanity. You talked about how science has evolved over, um, over time and over civilization, and I wonder, what um, new discoveries do you think are on the horizon that you'll be writing about 10 years from now? <laughs> you know, 10 years, it's, uh, it's tough. There's all kinds of interesting things going on in planetary science. Uh, in particular, we've got the uh, Mars Perseverance rover that'll be launching towards uh, Mars in July, I believe, and lands on Mars next year. And we've got a couple of uh, spacecraft right now, Osiris Rex and a Japanese spacecraft called Hayabusa 2, which have visited asteroids and scooped up samples of material that they're gonna be bringing back to Earth so that we'll be able to study asteroid material in the laboratory. So there's gonna be a lot of really cool things. And maybe the biggest, you probably uh, know, I mentioned in the story that we only first discovered planets around other stars. Uh, about 25 years ago, but by now we've discovered something like uh, more than 4,000 planets around other stars, and it's very likely that 10 years from now that number will be tens of thousands of planets around other stars. We'll be learning a lot about those things. And I hope we'll learn something about dark matter and dark energy by then, but uh, those are proving to be very difficult mysteries for scientists. This uh, video will be aired during the International Dark Sky Week, and I think it will be at the same time as the Lyrids meteor shower. Is that right? Uh, you know, I don't know offhand which meteor shower we've got, but that would be cool. Can have you it, have it at the same time. <laughs> Can you speak <laughs> it all to um, humanity's perspective over time of meteor showers? You talked a lot about the different things rotating around Earth that we could see from Earth and people's interpretation of it. What was the interpretation of meteor showers? So meteor showers were generally thought to be things that were just phenomenal of our own atmosphere. It did not, because they thought of a separate Earth and heavens, it did not make sense to them that it could actually be something coming in from space to the Earth. Although there were a few people, even back in ancient Greek times, who had that idea. So I, I probably other people should mute here just so we don't get the echo. Um, 
so meteors were, were a big mystery for a long time because they didn't know what they might be, but it was the rocks landing, meteorites. When, when a meteor is the flash of light we see in the sky, if it comes from a particle that's big enough to leave a rock behind hitting the ground, then we call it a meteorite. And there were some people who guessed correctly that those were coming from space even thousands of years ago. But now we know that that is the case. So our perspective on that shifted a lot. In fact, now we know where meteor showers come from. They come from the fact that there's comets that shed this material as they orbit the sun. And the reason we see a meteor shower at the same time from one year to the next is because we're passing through the material that that comet has shed at the same time each year as we orbit the sun. So I have a question for the students on the call, and I'm wondering <clears throat> what um, objects in the night sky you may have seen, and if you have any questions about what you saw. Go ahead, Ellie, I'm gonna unmute in here. Uh, um, so nowadays, the meteors are known as good luck or wishes, but I've read that back in olden times, the meteors were actually considered as severe bad luck or even dead or the sign of a very bad plague coming through. Um, why, how did it transfer from like everybody's going to die to good luck? Um, so it's actually, it's comets that had that connotation to the meteors because we see them so often they didn't uh, as far as I know have a particular connotation to them but comets which we don't see in the night sky very often only every few years is there a comet that's uh, bright enough to be seen with the naked eye or binoculars so comets were considered to be a bad omen in ancient times and the way they kind of got changed to good luck is is partly because now if you're the first person to discover a comet it gets named after you so that's kind of good luck if you're the one who finds it. What is a comet? A comet, so asteroids you probably know are these rocks that orbit the sun, but they're not big enough to be called planets. Comets are basically the same thing, except for that instead of being made just of rock, they also contain a lot of ice. And so if a comet happens to come in close toward the sun, then the sun's heat will start to evaporate some of that ice so it sheds outward and makes a big ball that we call the coma around this, the part, that the chunk that looks like the asteroid. And then some of it will be blown by the solar wind into the shape of a tail, so a big long tail on the comet. And because they have a lot of ice, that means comets come from very far away. So most asteroids are in the asteroid belt, which is between Mars and Jupiter. Most comets are out beyond the orbit of Neptune, where Pluto is, or even farther away than that. And so every once in a while, something will disturb a comet's orbit, send it coming in toward the sun, and those are the rare times when we'll see a comet with a long tail. But there's lots and lots of comets out there. And if you visit one, they would look just like an asteroid. It's just that they're made of more ice instead of only rock. So you mentioned the word coma uh, um, in regard to the comma or comet. Is that related to a comma in a sentence? Like, is the shape at all relevant to the name? No, it, the word comet and the coma come from, uh, I believe it's the uh, Greek word for hair. So a comb. Right, that's, that's where it's, what it's related to. Do you know where that comes from? I don't know the, the original. It could be that the comma comes from the same thing. I don't know for sure, but I do know it's from the hair because comets look hairy with their big long tails. What other questions do the students have about objects that you've seen in the night sky or things that you've learned about the universe? Hi, did you have a question? Um, 
do you um what kind, what else kind of um um solar systems are out there? Oh, excellent question. So when we say solar system, we basically mean a star and its planets. Um, so all solar systems are a star and planets. Sometimes they might have more than one star, like I showed you that painting with the double star there and the planet orbiting around it. The main difference from one solar system to the next, from what we're learning from our discoveries about planets around other stars, is that solar systems have many different arrangements of planets and planets vary in size more than they do in our solar system. In our solar system, there's Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars are the four small planets and they're all close to the sun. And then Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune are the much bigger planets and they're all far from the sun. But some other solar systems have the planets more mixed up, like they have big planets closer to the sun and so on. So we've learned a lot about how it must be that planets form and how solar systems form by studying the different arrangements of planets in other solar systems. Charlotte, did you have a question? Um, no, but I have a comment. Okay, so me and my dad are gonna try to take a picture of the Atlas comet tonight. Oh, excellent. Excellent, that should be a lot of fun. Yeah, we just figured out how to take pictures with my camera on the telescopes. Fantastic, fantastic. Hopefully lots of people will try that. He's also trying to get a new dome placed in there. Oh, cool. Um, I just wanted to tell you that my cousin um, loves watching the stars in the solar systems and stuff like that. Excellent. Well, you know, I, I hope everybody loves going out there and watching the stars. And uh, it's one of the reasons why we want to keep our skies dark at night is so that everybody will get a chance to see it. You know, if you go back to what I talked about in the beginning of the story from ancient times, the sky was very, very important to people because everybody saw it at night. And today, most people live in big cities with lots of lights around. So there's a lot of people around the world who've really never seen what the night sky actually looks like. And I think that's kind of sad. And hopefully we'll find a way to get the dark night skies back for everyone in the future. Um, so uh, earlier you mentioned Einstein's theory of general relativity. Well, in Einstein's theory of general relativity, there is how, um, I forget the exact word of frame drag. How exactly did he figure out about frame drag when it can't be observed even barely by Earth's orbit? So that's a very, very good question. Uh, frame dragging is one of the effects of, that is predicted by Einstein's general theory of relativity. It has to do with the way gravity affects the, when an object's rotating, what happens around that. Um, in fact, it comes into play in that picture of the black hole. So what Einstein did was he came up with that understanding. The th general theory of relativity is a theory of gravity. It actually takes the place of Newton's theory of gravity because it extends what Newton discovered to much stronger gravitational fields than Newton's theory works for. And um, you can see I have a book about that here, What is Relativity, if you want to learn more about that. And um, so what Einstein did in his theory was he came up with the mathematics of how gravity works and then he could use it to predict all kinds of effects or other people could use it to predict other effects from that same mathematically based theory. So frame dragging is one of the predicted effects that was only measured fairly recently for the first time. But every time we make a measurement to test whether Einstein's theory is correct, it checks out. Its predictions turn out to be correct so far. All right. Any, anything else? We, we can stop if, we're, if everybody's, everybody's questions are covered. Or if anybody else has another one, we can do it. All right. Well, thank you very, very much. 
Thank you, Jeff. That was a, a great introduction to um, humanity's perspective of the universe over time. It was a lot of fun learning from you. Thanks for your time. Appreciate it. And good luck to everybody at your night sky observing. Thanks.